last year at this time, you may remember. It was a tumultuous time. Powerful people fell from grace. Matt Lauer, Charlie Rose, Harvey Weinstein, eventually 20 members of Congress. At the time, we didn't realize the impact of what became known as the Me Too movement, but this momentum was starting. Time Magazine actually figured it out when they named on their cover the person of the year what they called the silence breakers. One of, the mo one of those silence breakers, probably one of the most powerful women in the, in the country right now is a woman by the name of Sheryl Sandberg. Some of you may have heard of Sandberg. I actually heard her speak at the Global Leadership Summit last year. She had some fantastic insights into business, but she also told a personal story about losing her husband at a young age from a heart attack. Now, some of you have heard of Sandberg. She was a top executive at Google and moved over and became now she is the number two person at Facebook, and she is receiving a lot of scrutiny for the issues that's been going on with Facebook. But one of the things that she talked about in an interview, she had a really unique insight into the Me Too movement. She said in that interview, in my career, men have placed their hand in my knee under the table. Men have offered to mentor me if I came up to their hotel room. I've had men show up at my hotel room and I needed to call security. Now, now here's the interesting part of her interview. Something I didn't pick up on, but I know that many of you as women probably already know this. She said, never has anyone beneath me tried to do this. It is always someone who believed they were in a position of power over me. Somehow they believed they had power over me to influence me, to lead me to do something I would not do. The Me Too movement. Now you're probably thinking to yourself, okay, what does this have to do with Advent? What, what, what does this have to do with our sermon series on joy? Well, today we're going to hear a passage that you've probably heard before. As I told you last week, Advent is all about hearing over and over and over and over these stories because we need to hear them because this is a season, this is a time that we don't always feel joy. And today's passage is unique in the amount, in not only the perspective of the speaker, but also unique in the message behind it. So we're going to hear a passage from Luke. Chapter, chapter 1, 39 through 53. Soon after Mary got ready and hurried off to town to the hill country of Judea, she went into Zechariah's house and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby moved within her. Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and said in a loud voice, You are the most blessed of all women, and blessed is the child you will bear. Why should this great thing happen to me, that my Lord's mother comes to visit me? For as soon as I heard your greeting, the baby within me jumped with gladness. How happy you are to believe that the Lord's message will come true. Mary said, My heart praises the Lord. My soul is glad because God is my Savior. For he has remembered me, his lowly servant. From now on, all people will call me happy because of the great things the mighty God has done for me. His name is holy from one generation to another. He shows mercy to those who honor him. He has stretched out his mighty arm and scattered the proud with all their plans. He has brought down mighty kings from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away with empty hands. Thank you, Lord. Okay, let's do some background here. First, who is this Elizabeth? Well, her and Zechariah are an older couple, and, and they don't have any children. And Zechariah, we know, is a priest. And so one of the greatest honors for a priest in this time period was to enter into the Holy of Holies at the temple in Jerusalem. And it's only, only one person got to do it once a year. So, I mean, it was a huge honor. And so when Zechariah goes in to offer a sacrifice to God in the Holy of Holies, an angel appears to him and says, God has heard your prayers and your wife Elizabeth will have a baby. And as I said, Zechariah and Elizabeth are getting up in their age and, and this, does, this seems <clears throat> very fanciful. 
And so Zechariah actually questions the, the angel, doesn't believe he doesn't have the power. And the angel says, oh yeah, you're mute. And he is mute until the baby is born. <clears throat> so, that you need to understand that because that, uh, that leads us to the prelude that, that Laura just read to us. And what we find here is Elizabeth is Mary's cousin. And when they greet each other, they find out that both of them are pregnant and these are miracles. And what we have here is the meeting of the two. Elizabeth is pregnant with John the Baptist. And Mary is pregnant with Jesus. Now this story takes place in Luke, and, and if you know anything about Luke, Luke is a master storyteller. In fact, we have details in this passage here that we do not find in any of the other Gospels. And Luke, in kind of setting this up, he, he, he says something really unique, and, and it, it's actually a few verses before the reading that we just had here. And many people miss it, and so I want to share with you what Luke says at verse 5 in chapter 1. In the days of King Herod of Judea. He starts the story here. Why? Well, King Herod must have been a really powerful person. A very important person. Now, what do we know about King Herod? We know that he dies around the year 4. We know that he ruled for about 30 years. And we also know that he must have been really, really, really powerful in the world, at least in Judea. As a leader, we know that King uh, Herod uh, built a lot of things. And in fact, if you go to the Holy Land today, you're going to find about 10 or 12 of these archaeological sites that were actually built by Herod. One time, he built an entire city. And I'm not talking about a village. He built an entire city. At another time, he, built, he put a palace on top of a man-made mountain. Imagine that. In fact, it was told that it rivaled the pyramids in size. Some of you probably have heard of Masada. Uh, but a hundred years later, the, the Israelites, they hide out on Masada as they're fighting the Romans. But a hundred years before, when Herod was king, he built a palace on top of Masada with a swimming pool. And probably one of the most famous things that he built was the temple. He rebuilt the temple. Now, it was destroyed, but today what you find is the foundation walls there. And this is known as the Wailing Wall. Probably one of the most famous places. So, so he was well known as a builder of things. Now think about this. Luke is writing this story some 60 years later and people still know of this guy. That's how important he was. Not only was he an important builder, he was wealthy. He was also a bit self-absorbed. He considered himself above the law. He was a king and he felt like he could do whatever he wanted. So uh, when wife number one was getting up there in age and he wanted to dismiss her, he sent his wife number one and his son with her off to a foreign land. And then he marries a younger woman, more beautiful, and wife number two, and, and things are going along fine until he gets kind of jealous and he's thinking that she's having an affair. So he puts her to death. And the two sons that he has with her, he puts into prison because he's thinking they're going to overthrow him. So he goes on to wife number three, and things are going along fine until he gets jealous of her. He thinks that she's having an affair, and so he puts her to death. And the youngest son almost dies, except Herod dies while the youngest son is in prison. You're probably thinking to yourself, okay, I, this Herod guy, I've, I've heard of him somewhere. If you're familiar with the wise man story, this is the same King Herod. These travelers from the east, they arrive, and what do they do? They pay homage not to King Herod, but to this boy who is to be king of the Jews. Now imagine that, probably one of the most powerful men in the world, an egomaniac, a person that puts rivals to death, and these three wise men are looking for his rival. So if you remember the story, what does King Herod do? He's so paranoid, he sends troops and he kills every boy under the age of two. Herod is going to do whatever it takes to stay in power. This is how Luke begins his story. Kind of gives us a sense of, of the rest of the gospel, his reign and what is taking place. And in the context of this, Luke says this at verse 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth. The angel is sent to Mary. 
Now, who is this Mary? Well, we don't know much about her. There is a lot of legends about her. We don't know how many of those legends are true. But the scripture at least tells us is that she is from Nazareth. So if you look at this map here, uh, Jerusalem is down here, and Nazareth is up here. It's about 65 miles north of Jerusalem. But that's not the place I want to talk about. Because anyone that was anyone in the north knew about Sepphoris. That was the place to be. Now today it's an archaeological site. But in the time of Mary, people went to Sepphoris. You, the ruins there are beautiful. They have all of these tapestries and tiled walls and floors. It's just this great place. You have a sense that it was very wealthy. The mark, they had marketplaces, they had shops, they had theaters, they had schools. Anyone who was anyone up in the north went up to Sepphoris. But Nazareth, Nather, Nazareth was so insignificant. In fact, it was not even on the map. Do you know any places like that that are not even on the map? We have some of those places around here. It's an unincorporated town. There's no post office. There's no school. We know that people live there in a place like uh, Reddington, but it's not even on the map. What do people do? If you take a map of Nebraska, you zero it in on the panhandle, you will find Geary, you'll find Scotts Bluff and Shadron and Alliance, but you won't find Reddington. But you know people are living there. Reddington is like Nazareth. And here's the interesting thing. This is where Jesus starts his ministry. Probably one of the best lines that comes from the gospel is from the gospel of John. Someone comes up to Nathan and he says, Nathan, did you hear? We found the Messiah and he is from Nazareth. And what does Nathan say? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? <laughs> Nazareth is on the other side of the tracks. It's how most of Nebraska thinks of people in the panhandle. <laughs> the high and mighty wouldn't know anything about Nazareth. They wouldn't even care. Nazareth, the lip of a town in the north, and the angel goes there. The angel didn't go to the sculptured lawns, the wealth of Sepphoris. The angel finds a girl in poverty in a poor village who obviously had a beautiful heart. Now, there's a second thing that we know about Mary. We know that she was engaged to a man that was about twice her age. Our best guess is that Mary was about 13 or 14, the age of my youngest daughter. And you're thinking to yourself, why someone so young? Well, actually, this is very common. The average lifespan of a woman in this time period was 35 years old. So at the age of 13 or 14, one-third of their life was already over. And the angel chooses this girl from nowheresville. So picture this in your mind. Luke starts the story with the most powerful man in the world, and in the midst of the storytelling, mentions an angel that goes to the least powerful person in the world. And the angel approaches a girl and says in the Catholic tradition, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Now our modern translations have this at verse 28. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. Now, greeting, greetings in Greek is kara or charis, and is literally translated as joy or rejoice or grace. Now, think about this. We can translate greetings, Mary, as rejoice, Mary, or have joy, Mary. And when the angel says that you are full of joy... Excuse me, and when the angel says you are full of grace, we have here the same word. So thus we can translate this as you are full of joy, or you will be full of joy, or the child in your womb is the source of joy, or you can actually translate it as you are so close to God's ultimate plan for creation. Now Mary says, and Mary doesn't quite understand this, Luke says that she ponders this in her heart. <clears throat> now, note this. God chooses somebody from nowheresville. And if you know your scripture, you know that this is pretty common. When God chooses somebody, God chooses the least likely. When God goes to a school, God doesn't choose the valedictorian. God chooses someone who is really struggling. When God chose Abraham and Sarah, they were in their retirement years. And God said, okay, in your twilight years, you're going to have a baby and you're going to move to another town. When God chose a covenant people, God chose someone that was in slavery. 
When God chose Moses, he was a fugitive. He had just murdered an Egyptian. When God chose a king, God didn't choose the strongest, the brightest, but the youngest and the scrawniest. Paul says to the Corinthians as a way to kind of build them up, he says, but God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not, to reduce to nothing things that are. But at least God's consistent, right? So what does this mean to us? And as I look around this room, many of us have been to college. We have those four walls that Dave Ramsey talks about, transportation and clothing and food and shelter. We do not struggle for want. We are not the lowly. So what does this mean? I think I know what this means. If God wants to choose us, maybe we need to focus on that sense of humbleness. Because there's a consistent call in Scripture about that. James says this, Humble yourselves before the Lord and He will exalt you. If you remember our stewardship, Series. We talked about this. It's a sense of the heart. It means that we don't look into your pocketbook to make sure that you've spent everything. God looks into your heart to see if you are humble. That's why Jesus says that the first will be the last. Jim Collins writes a book called Good to Great. In it, he describes what differentiates a corporation from good to being great. And in the book, he describes about six or seven things. He says the number one thing is the content of the character of the CEO. And he describes them as lovable five people. He says, um, in his words, they, are, they had a paradoxical mix of humility and professional will. Essentially, it means it's not about me. It's about serving my employees, about serving my customers, about serving my community. Colin says that these leaders have a drive to succeed on behalf of the company, on behalf of the stakeholder, on behalf of the client, on behalf of the employee. They had a combination of this drive and humility. Now, <clears throat> Collins follows this up by a book called Why the Mighty Fall. Now, here he compares these companies that were once at the top of their game, but they fail. Many of them are now bankrupt. And he gives several reasons, and he says that number one on that list is hubris for success. The more prideful we become, the more likely we will fail. When we look at the stories of pride and arrogance in Scripture, we find people that do succeed for a time. I mean, King Herod served and reigned for 30 years. But how is King Herod viewed today? So let's go back to our story. After Mary learns that she is pregnant, she travels 65 miles to her cousin Elizabeth in a village just outside of Jerusalem. Let me remind you of Elizabeth's words when her cousin shows up. And she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Now think about this. Mary, or excuse me, Elizabeth calls Mary blessed. What does it mean to be blessed? Well, today... I've got plenty of money. I've got a chance to travel. I'm comfortable. Life is good. But none of these things would describe the life of Mary. She can't get married. She is pregnant. She is a stain to her family. In fact, those of you that attend our Bible study know that there's a provision in the Bible of stone, for the family to stone adulterers. Now, we know that Mary didn't commit adultery, but the only person that knows that is an angel. So this is what Mary is living under. And it's certainly, I don't think Mary would be considered blessed today. So maybe the Bible has a different definition of what it means to be blessed. Before we get into that definition, I want you to do something right now. I want you to turn to the person on your right and say, God bless you. Now turn to the person on your left and say, and also with you. We, you. Don't worry about the people in front of you, behind you, they got enough blessings. There you go. <laughs> now that you have just blessed each other, I want to give you a suggestion of what the Bible means by blessing. It just might mean that you are in the middle of God's plans. Maybe God has a higher purpose for yourself. 
Maybe God wants you to experience a holy presence this season. Maybe a sense of peace and joy. Even in the midst of your hardships. Mary is blessed, certainly not financially. But she is so close to God as anyone ever got. So when you say God bless you, is this exactly what you mean? Be careful. God bless you means that you are in the middle of God's plans. God bless you means that you might find yourself used by God for something bigger than yourself. Now you might be thinking, maybe I shouldn't have said God bless you to my neighbor now. I want to draw yourself to something that I find fascinating in this passage. Listen to the response of Mary at hearing the news. Here am I, the servant of the Lord, let it be with me according to your word. This means that every morning you've got to get on your knees and say, Okay, God, use me. Send me. Let me be a part of this purpose, this plan that you have for me. And, and, and I want you to notice that, that what Mary says when she is received by Elizabeth, she says that she feels joy. This sermon series, we're talking about joy. It is the same joy that Elizabeth said that she feels when the baby, John the Baptist, leaps in her womb. With this sense of joy, I want you now to turn to your neighbor and say, this day, choose joy. Now again, you might be asking yourself, okay, so what does this have to do with the Me Too movement? You know, there's one thing that we know about the Bible, is that most of it was written by men. But there are some snippets, there are some segments that we are pretty sure are written by women. And today we have one of those. I'm going to draw your attention to verse 52 again. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. Mary says these words. And when I see and hear story after story after story of people who use their power for non for bad reasons or are used to having their way or thought that they could keep things quiet, I'm reminded of these words. I think of these women who took a chance and risked everything for speaking I think of my daughters and my future granddaughters who will live in a different time. Who can say, and say now, this happened to me and I'm not alone. As you know, I live in a household of women. And one of our favorite movies is Wonder Woman. It's a great movie, great music, and talk about a great message. You know, here you have a woman who's a lead character. You might be thinking, well, there's a lot of movies with a lead character, but how many of them were the woman as the savior of the world? And when I watch that movie, I think of my daughters. And it reminds me that we raise them to be strong women. We want them to grow up in a society where they will speak up to those who are trying to use power for wrong purposes. And when I think of those situations... I think of the patron saint of women, a 13-year-old girl from Nowheresville called Nazareth. And the Catholic Church lifts her up. Maybe the, it's time for the Protestants to do the same. To me, it's a picture of joy. This whole series is about choosing joy this day because we often don't feel it at this time period. But Mary tells us this day you will be blessed which just means that you might be in the middle of God's plans. Now stand up for what is right. I want to finish today with a story from Beth Backus. She is an Assembly of God pastor, and this is what she wrote. An eight-year-old girl with long braids bounces into her Sunday school room wearing her favorite yellow dress, never imagining the terrifying experience about to unfold. The roaming hands of a man she trusted, her teacher, touch her in ways that leave her stunned and afraid even while the man's wife is in the same room teaching other children. The girl swallows hard, blinking back tears. Whom should she tell? Would anyone believe her? In the fall of 2017, news stories about prominent influential men facing accusations of sexual assault sent shockwaves to the nation. The sad truth is this. What made
made headlines in Hollywood and beyond happens in church too. Within 24 hours of Me Too emerging as a viral hashtag for victims of sexual assault, more than 4.7 million women and some men had added their voices to the thread. For many, it was the first time they publicly declared their painful experience. In the aftermath, dozens of men lost positions of power as their courageous victims brought to light their dark secrets. Sexual abuse in any form is fundamentally about power. Because church systems operate with some level of hierarchy, there is a high risk of leaders abusing that power over those they serve. Ed Stetzer tweeted about the Me Too movement, this isn't just a Hollywood problem, a politics problem, a church problem, or even an American problem, it's a people problem. Unfortunately, sexual misconduct is prevalent in every segment of our society, and the church is not immune. As a response to the Me Too movement, many women of faith have rallied to bring awareness to the problem that often remains hidden in our churches. Many victims hear that they should simply forgive their abusers. Such a mentality lets violators off the hook rather than holding them accountable for their actions. This is neither scriptural nor acceptable. How did Jesus respond to issues of sexual misconduct? When he met an adulterous woman, Jesus reacted, reacted unexpectedly with compassion, breaking cultural norms. The idea that women are to blame when violated perpetuates a culture that has fostered misogynistic behavior far too long. When Jesus told the angry crowd of religious leaders they had permission to cast the first stone only if they were without sin, he set a precedent for having compassion for the marginalized victims of sexual improprieties. Too often, the victims of sexual misconduct suffer in silence. Once you deal with a perpe perpetrator, it's easy to neglect caring for those who now face the challenge of walking the long road toward healing. Victims of sexual crimes often feel shame and suffer from depression and isolation. Taking care of victims is the responsibility of the church as we seek to bring healing to the wounded. I'm an ordained Assembly of God minister who has worked in the church my entire adult life. I've been a church planter and served for more than a decade in network district leadership. Yet the church I love has also been a place of deep pain. I was that innocent little girl with braids who walked into Sunday school class and encountered a pedophile. When I finally told my parents, the church elders reluctantly told the per per perpetrator he could no longer attend the church. Sadly, a decision that was short lived. My abuser was a well-respected man who had literally helped build the church with his bare hands. Everyone loved him and could not grasp the reality that he was capable of harming a child. After I broke the silence, other women in the church who had attended his Sunday school class came forward to share similar stories. When the church initially asked him to leave, he soon returned about the time my family moved to another town. I read his obituary recently that stated he was a lifelong member of, the ch of that church when he died. I cannot help but wonder were there other Me Too victims of this man in subsequent years. I lived through a Church Too experience and know a multitude of women who have suffered through sexual assault by men in spiritual authority. Tragically, those we trust to lead and guide us sometimes turn out to be ferocious wolves Jesus warns us about in Matthew 7. It compounds the damage when the people we turn to for help fail to act with biblical conviction and common sense. The time is now for us to act. We must model courageous leadership and stand on behalf of generations of women who are depending on the leaders in our churches to protect and care for them. Each of us is accountable to steward this significant movement in history with wisdom. As a ministry leader and a church to survivor, I implore us to live out Proverbs 31.8. Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. Ensure justice for those being crushed. Yes. Speak up for the poor and helpless, and see that they get justice. Joy for the lowly. We are in the middle of God's plans. Being blessed means that we walk with God 